you have to presume that all your information is out there on the dark web. Right. I mean, all these scammers are talking to each other. They're selling your information. A long list of this information is getting sold so they can blast out phone calls or emails with all the bots. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to protect yourself because the attacks are incessant. They're coming at you from all directions and all ways, shapes, or forms. You mentioned the limbic system, and that is so mm -hmm. true. Think about a big market drop or crash. It's the same thing that act gets activated. It's almost like a scam. You've got to weather the storm. You've got mm -hmm. to trust but verify that things are going to be okay. You just got to avoid taking quick action. Call somebody. Other things that you can do, I guess, for credit card scams is don't use a debit card. Use your credit card because it mm -hmm. protects you federally, and the companies want to protect you. How is it that these are so believable? I think there's a confluence of factors. Number one, again, urgency, mm -hmm. right? All of us, all of us, when we are pressed with a sense of urgency, mm -hmm. there's a fire, mm -hmm. there's a, metaphorically speaking, there's a fire, there's a grizzly bear, right? So we are activated, we are afraid, and we are willing to do whatever it takes to fix the problem, right? And so that sense of urgency is often associated with a lot of these scams. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Catching Up to Fi, a podcast on mindset, money, and life for late starters of any age on their journey to financial independence. I'm Bill, and I'm a late starter. I'm Becky, and I'm also a late starter, and we're your hosts. We're here to help you with your journey to financial independence, no matter where you're starting from. We're gonna to talk to experts, other late starters, and explore topics related to our mission. Join us as we catch up to Fi together. Hello, and welcome back to Catching Up to Fi. I'm Bill Yount with my co-host, Becky Heptig, and it's snowing outside. Oh, my God. We're in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I have to get to work tomorrow in about four to six inches of snow. That shuts <laughs> us down. And you're sub-zero out there, Becky, right? That's right. Uh, this episode won't air for several weeks, but we're recording it during the big freeze that went across the U.S. And so today we were at negative 10 and it tried to snow, but it's very, very light because it's just so cold. <laughs> so I'm staying inside right, well, with my warm catching up to five sweatshirt on. <laughs> All right. Well, who do we have on the show today, uh, Becky? We've got a very special guest. Today, we're talking to Paula Pant. I'm very excited about that. And I am going to jump in with her intro, but then we're going to let Paula give us a little bit of her background also. All right. So Paula Pant is a podcast host, writer, speaker, and media commentator on financial independence, real estate investing, money management, and financial literacy. She's the creator and host of the Afford Anything podcast, which has more than 30 million downloads, 3,000 reviews, and is ranked by Apple Podcasts as one of the top 50 business podcasts. You can also hear Paula on the Stacking Benjamins podcast. She's the founder of AffordAnything.com, a personal finance and financial independence website that draws 2.5 million annual page views and holds more than 78,000 email subscribers. I first met Paula at Campfire Rocky Mountain 2019, and then again at the Choose FI Foundation gathering at FinCon in 2019. And we most recently hung out with Paula at Podcast Movement in Denver last August. It turns out Bill and I were both at FinCon 2019 in the same room at the same time with Paula, but we didn't know each other then. <laughs> <laughs> We're chatting with Paula today about a very important topic, scams against the elderly. Now, I'm going to guess that you know someone who has been scammed or even helped an older loved one deal with this issue. It is a huge problem. It's growing every day. So we hope that you listen to this episode, and I'm going to encourage you, listen to this episode all the way through to the very end because it is that important. And you're probably going to want to bookmark this one also. So Paula Pant, welcome to Catching Up to Fi. Oh, thank you so much for having me on. Well, it's awesome you to join us all the way from New York. It's been an honor to hang out with you and get to know you personally and to come on our little show. I'll tell you, we're really blessed. So some of our audience, they're new to Fi and they may mm -hmm. not know your background. 
They may not know where all this came from when it started and this Afford Anything brand. Can you take us briefly through your story, your Genesis story? Sure, absolutely. So when I graduated from college, which was in 2005, I did what everyone does, which is I, I got a job. And I became a newspaper reporter at a small newspaper in Colorado. And my starting salary was $21,000 per year. And over the span of the next three years, I got a couple of raises and promotions. So at the time that I quit that job, which was in 2008, I had a full-time salary of $31,000 per year. And that's the most money I've ever made as a W-2 employee working for somebody else. So with a salary ranging from 21000 through 31000 again, that's in 2005 through $2,008. So adjusted for, adjust that for inflation. But with a, a salary ranging around there, I knew a couple of things. I knew that I was not going to be able to make good money in my chosen field in journalism by working at a newspaper. I knew that for me, the future was going to be independent and it was going to be online as a journalist. And I also knew that if it was going to be independent, that would give me the leeway to be able to be location independent as well. I would be able to travel. And so in 2008, I did what nobody ever does. I quit voluntarily, quit a job at a print newspaper, which is unheard of. And at that time, I had about $25,000 saved. I'd saved about one year salary over the span of the previous three years of work. Wow. Now that did not come from my W-2 income. That came from the 1099 income that I was making during the evenings and weekends because I was freelance writing every evening, every weekend. And I saved on average about $800 per month, every month over the span of three years. So after three years, that adds up to $25,000. That's about one year salary. So with that in the bank, I quit my job, bought a one-way plane ticket to Cairo, Egypt, and for the next two years, lived out of a backpack and traveled predominantly in countries where the dollar exchange rate really worked in my favor. I was in Egypt. I was in Laos. I was in Cambodia. I was in mostly places where the, the US dollar went a lot further, and I would just go to one spot. I'd go to Vientiane in Laos and just park myself there for two weeks or three weeks and write freelance articles and kind of really explore Vientiane in depth. And then I would pack my bags and go to Phnom Penh in Cambodia and do it all over again. Right. So I lived that lifestyle for a total of 27 months. That was 2008 through 2010. And when I was doing that, the most consistent piece of feedback that I heard from my friends was they said, oh, I would love to do something like that, but I can't afford it. Every single person, I would love to do that. I would love to travel, but I can't afford it. And that drove me nuts for so many reasons, not the least of which was I knew that all of my friends were making way more money than I was. And they made different choices, right? And they had stainless steel appliances. They would go to bars and get these $14 cocktails. They would go to concerts with $100 concert tickets, right? And there's nothing fundamentally wrong with that. If you sit down and you weigh the options and you say, would I rather travel or would I rather have a luxury apartment with fancy cocktails and expensive concert tickets? And if you sit down and you weigh those choices and you come to the thoughtful, deliberate, conscious decision that you would rather have the luxury apartment and the cocktails, great. I applaud that. You, that is a deliberate decision. But if that's a deliberate choice, then you would not say, I can't afford it. You would say, it's not a priority. I would love to travel, but it's not a priority. I would love to travel, but I choose not to because there are other things that are more important to me. That would be the statement. To say I can't afford it is disempowering and also untrue. And so after hearing that time and time and time again, in February of 2011, I started Afford Anything because I wanted to spread the message that you can afford anything. You just can't afford everything. Every choice that you make carries a trade-off. Saying yes to something implicitly means you are saying no to something else. And that doesn't just apply to your money. That applies to any limited resource that you have to manage. It applies to your time. It applies to your energy. It applies to your attention, right? It applies to 
every limited resource. Mm -hmm. And that central core message, that was what I wanted to impart on anyone who would listen. Mm -hmm. So that began in February of 2011. And here we are today. That's just a genius, catchy phrase. I mean, it really works for everything, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as you said. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's value-based and you make decisions that have impact elsewhere in your life. And that just exploded into your brand. And where are you today with this? Oh, so the Afford Anything podcast is the, the main vehicle. It's what we are primarily known for. The Afford Anything podcast has, as you've said, we've had over 30 million downloads. We, on average, get around maybe 400,000 downloads per month. So we have a very thriving community. And yeah, we have a newsletter. Like, I mean, you, you know the stats. We have a newsletter with 78,000 newsletter subscribers. I've been shepherding this community for the last 13 years. And I often think of Afford Anything, not necessarily even as a... A personal finance show, but truly what we are is we are a show about how to make better decisions, how to think critically and evaluate your options and make better choices. We're a show about how to think, becoming a more clear, cogent thinker. We're a show about that told through the lens of money. Hmm. You recently interviewed an astronaut, which I thought was absolutely fascinating where ah, it talks yes. about making making goals and reaching your goal, and he failed two or three times, and lo and behold, he became an astronaut. And so you do have a far-reaching breadth of topics that you cover. You're right. It's not just a financial mm -hmm. podcast. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So about a, a year or so ago, I went to Columbia. I did a fellowship at Columbia University in business and economics journalism because I wanted some really in-depth training about how to talk about economics to a broad audience, right? My training was as a journalist, but my training was as a print newspaper journalist. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to go back to school, A, to get more broadcast focused training and B, to get training that's specific to the world of economic journalism. And what I found largely was in terms of how to talk to an audience about economics is sometimes you talk about astronomy, you talk about Coca-Cola, you talk about shoes and sneakerheads, you talk about all of these different facets of life because everything is economics. Mm. So has your recent stint at Columbia, has that changed what Paula Pant slash afford anything is going to be or the direction it's going to go in the future? One of the things we do, so on the, typically we are a weekly podcast, right now at least we're a weekly podcast. We are going to, after episode 500, we're going to escalate to twice a week. So effective episode 500 is going to air on 424 24, April 24th, 2024. And after episode 500, we're going to be a twice a week show. But anyway, all of that is to say that right now we are normally a, a once a week show, but on once a month, on the first Friday of the month, we air a first Friday bonus episode. And that typically has been our test kitchen. It's our experimental playground. And we have played around with a bunch of different formats. We, for example, briefly had a stint called Invest Anywhere. That was the first Friday theme. What I've started doing since going to Columbia and getting trained as an economics journalist is the first Friday episodes, I've done sort of a this month in the economy analysis, right? So, hey, here's what happened. The Federal Reserve, for example, in December, the Federal Reserve published its beige book, right, which is a snapshot of economic conditions. It's basically the Federal Reserve's 2023 year in review, mm -hmm. right? So one of the things that I did for the January First Friday episode is really look through that beige book to try to pull out data and share it with the audience in a way that makes it interesting, that makes it sound like more entertaining than simply reading a Fed report. <laughs> and so so I think that's the, what I've gotten from the, from doing that on the first Friday episodes, I've gotten very good feedback from our community. And so I think we'll not only 
continue to do that every first Friday, but we may even intensify it, make that a, a more than just once a month feature. Mm-hmm. Our audience also needs to know that you're a real estate maven, and that started somewhere in all of this. And so you have your hands in many hats. Can you speak briefly to why that journey? I know you don't take, like talking about real estate that much, but you have a class because you mm-hmm. get these questions so often. But yeah. where did this real estate journey come from and how does it dovetail with the rest of your empire? Well, as I began making money, I started investing my money into lots of different assets, right? So I started buying index funds. I have a very, very, very small, very small crypto allocation. And I also started buying rental properties. And it's funny because nobody ever asks me about my index funds, even (laughs) though that is as a percentage of my net worth, that is ballpark, I would say about equal to the value of all of my properties. I have just as much money in index funds as I do in rental properties. But rental properties are tangible, they're visceral, and maybe they're a little bit more unique. Lots of people have index funds relative to the percentage of people who own index funds, fewer people own rental properties. And so I think for all of those reasons, I started getting a lot of questions about rental properties. And I just started getting from the audience. And I just started getting the same questions again and again and again, to such an extent that it was clear that there was appetite for a structured, guided course that would teach people, all right, if this is something that you also want to do, here's exactly how you get started. Here's a step-by-step guide to knowing whether or not you're ready. And then here's how to analyze properties. Here's how to find properties, whether locally or out of state. Here's how to obtain the financing. Here's how to actually close the deal. Here's what all the terms in the contract mean. Here's how to build your team, particularly if you're building a remote team from out of state, how to build out a team of property managers and general contractors and and so forth. And then here's how to protect all of your assets. So here's the map. Here's the flow. Here's how you do it. Boom. Well, I have to ask you then, what about your index funds? Nobody asks you. (laughs) (laughs) Do you stick to three fund portfolio? Do you follow Jail Collins? Uh, What is Paula Pan's index fund portfolio? Tell us now. (laughs) We're getting a scoop. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I have a barbell allocation, so I do not have a bond allocation. Uh, I am all equities, 100% equities. Ah. Wow. All right. Well, Bill, don't forget, she is a little younger than us. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, I'm about 80%, 20%. So I'm not far behind, but I'm 58. So I got to be a little bit more cautious. <laughs> well, and I am 70, 30. The 30 is bonds and cash. And in three weeks, I'm going to be 68. <laughs> so there you go. Mm. Oh, happy, happy birthday. Well, happy you. almost birthday. <laughs> thank you. You know, Paulo, my oldest son also does real estate. I know he has gleaned a lot of useful information from what you have out there. And back in the day, I don't know if you do this anymore, but I know back in the day, you actually shared real numbers with your listeners Mm -hmm. from your real estate portfolio and Mm -hmm. showed them how these numbers were working, the income, the outflows and all that. And, And he found that very, very useful. So thank you. Oh, excellent. Excellent. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. I I think those videos are still up on my YouTube channel, Mm -hmm. youtube.com slash afford anything. I was looking at it the other day and there's a handful of videos with like March, 2017 income report, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Right. Right. Transparency works wonders. And uh, uh, you're a very transparent person uh, and we appreciate that. Becky, we better jump into our topic today. Otherwise we're never going to get there. I know. I know. This has been great though. So, all right, Paula, we are going to Mm -hmm. talk about scams against the elderly. And Mm. what I wanted to do here at the beginning is just give people a yardstick to give folks an idea of how big this problem is. So I have a list of stats here that um, we got from an article that you sent us. It's actually an FBI article. So this is speaking to how big this problem is. So according to the FBI, the over 60 crowd is the second highest in number of victims and the first highest in the number of dollars lost. And mm. we are double over 60 and the number of dollars lost is double 
the second place age group. In 2022, Mm -hmm. 88,000 total victims by count and $3 billion in losses. Mm -hmm. And these are all 2022 stats. So the top crime type in number of victims, number one is call center fraud. So that's tech, Mm -hmm. customer support, government impersonation, and that kind of thing. That's 18,000. Non-payment, non-delivery was 8,000. Personal data breaches, 8,000. Confidence romance was Mm 7,000. And credit card and check fraud was 5,000. And those add up to 88,000. All right. So top crime types and the amount of dollars lost. Investment crime, 990 million. Tech support, 588 million. BEC or business email compromise and wire transfers. I know if anybody's bought a house recently, how many they would spend an hour telling you how to do your wire transfer so that right. you don't get scammed with that. So that's obviously a biggie. I know a few people who have been scammed from that. That's yeah. Oh, it's, uh, yes, yes. Crypto scams and means of payment are rapidly increasing and the confidence mm-hmm. romance is 419 million. And the last stat I wanted to share was victims and dollars by state. So the four top states where these occur are California, Florida, Texas, and New York. So what do those states have Mm -hmm. in common? They have an older population in some cases. Mm -hmm. Typically also a a wealthier population. Yes. More moneyed population. Yes. So why is the over 60 crowd targeted? For really a few reasons. Number one, the over 60 crowd tends to have more money, more accumulated assets than younger age groups, right? That's just naturally over the span of a person's lifetime, they're going to have assets that grow and compound in whether those be 401k assets, whether that be a home that is now paid off free and clear, typically over the span of a person's life, their wealth accumulates. And so people who are over 60 as a broad category have more money than people in their 20s or in their 30s. In addition to that, people who are over 60 often don't have the safeguards in place of being able to bounce this off of somebody that somebody who is younger would be, right? So if you're 45 and you receive a phone call saying, hey, this is the police, we've just arrested your son for a DUI, you need to send us $2,500 right now or your son is going to remain in jail. Right. If you're 45 and you receive that call, likely you're at work and you can then put down the phone and say to your colleague, oh, my goodness, my son just got a DUI. I need to go deal with this. And that conversation, the fact that somebody else is involved, you're, you now are more there's more people who are more likely to be able to spot the suspicious threads of, wait a second, why is it that you're not driving down to the courthouse or to the local jail to hand off this $2,500? And why is it that you can't just write a personal check? Why is it that you're going to some random address? And why is it that you have to give them a cashier's check? That sounds a little bit fishy, right? So when you've got those other people who you can bounce that off of, there are more people who are likely to flag it. Whereas if you're over 60, you're retired, you're more likely to be at home by yourself, right? Your kids have grown up, they're out of the house. You're more likely to be at home by yourself. There's nobody else who's around to flag this for you. Well, I have a personal story here. And like Mm -hmm. Becky said earlier, either we've been scammed, we know somebody's been scammed. And if you haven't been scammed, you just haven't been enough scammers because all your information's out there and it's going to happen. This is why Becky said this episode is so important. I had a family member, elderly, lived alone, much like you said, loves the computer, is always online, and got either through the computer or by phone call or both the threat that all of her information, financial and otherwise, was out there. And unless she did this, which turned into a Target gift card scam in order to get the money, unless she did this, all of it was going to be out there and she could lose all her money. And so... Mm -hmm. Somebody was preying on her. It was extortion. She was afraid, didn't understand tech, and thought 
even though she's a smart person, she got emotional about it. And guess what she didn't do? She did not call anybody. She mm -hmm. was told this, you've got to keep this secret. And if you tell anybody, it's all out there. And so this went on for a week. Mm. This person went to every Target store in the area buying gift cards mm. wow. and didn't call anybody for a week. I hate to say it, but this tallied up to probably a year's worth of spending. Wow. $37,000. Not an insignificant amount. No. For this person, not at all. And it, I couldn't believe that it happened. Uh, how did we get down this path, this little rabbit hole, through all the Swiss cheese holes to have this happen? I mean, my ID has been stolen. I have to put in extra protections because somebody tried to access my financial accounts. It, it's scary out there. It's not just little credit card fraud. It, it really happens. And then it's with you for the rest of your life. And right. you've got to take precautions mm -hmm. if right. you haven't taken them before. And the whole point of this episode is to take these precautions now. Right, right, right. <laughs> now, scammers prey on secrecy and on urgency, right? Secrecy and urgency. So, Bill, to what you said about how they told her not to tell anyone, right? That's a huge red flag. And you see this, again, in those scams of, hey, your son has a DUI, he's in jail. You can't tell anybody they'll tell you not to discuss it with anyone. The romance scams, right? Hey, they pretend to be, they'll position themselves as, as a lover or as a courter. But then they'll say, hey, don't tell anybody about this. And then they gain your trust in that way. But that secrecy, first of all, anytime that you receive a phone call, that's already a red flag at this point, right? And particularly if the caller tells you that you should not be discussing this, that this needs to be secret for any reason, or if they say that this is urgent and it's something that you have to do now, those are huge, huge red flags, right? The IRS is never going to call you and say, you urgently need to send us a check right now or you're going to go to jail. Mm. It doesn't happen, All right? So anytime that there's that urgency pressure, that's a huge, huge mm. red flag. So Becky, do you know anybody that's been scammed? Have you been scammed? No, I have not. But last fall, when we were in Bali, one of the girls that was there at the retreat with us told us a story about her dad. It was a romance scam. And I just want to say, when I was going through those stats, I was naming off different kinds of scams, and we're going to go through those. So don't be concerned that you don't know what we were talking about a few minutes ago. But her father got involved in a romance scam, and she finally figured out what was going on. And in her case, she even went to the bank to try to shut it down. And she could not because it's his account, it's his money. He can come in and buy a cashier's check if he wants to. They can talk to him about it, but nobody could literally shut it down. And the only thing that stopped it was when he emptied his 401k, which was to the tune of $160,000. Wow. So... Yes. She eventually figured it out and couldn't stop it and because she couldn't talk him out of it. She couldn't talk him into stopping. And these are victims of a crime. We can't blame the victim. There's a lot of shame involved in this. Oh, yeah. There's a lot yeah. of isolation and loneliness. And the criminal is to blame, yes. not the person yes. that succumbs to this crime. It, it's absolutely amazing. One more that I have to tell you about, because this, for whatever reason, in my family, there's been issues. And there, there, there's a scam where a family member who's a medical professional got a call from the sheriff's department. Okay. And the sheriff's department said, you missed this deposition. And there's a fine for having missed your deposition in this case. And they had personal information about the case because it was public. And it seemed incredibly legitimate. And this family member got scared, didn't know what to do. I mean, when you get this legal threat, it's like, mm -hmm. that's a system you don't want to get involved in. And it seemed legitimate. Luckily, she started talking about it. As you said, she was at work. She started talking about it with other folks. It got to the point where we actually called a lawyer friend and said, and we asked them, is this real? Can this possibly be real? 
And the lawyer said, absolutely not. This is a scam. But it sounded so real. Preying on a fear. Yep. Yep. I love those two points that you brought us, Paula, if it's urgent or if they want you to keep it secret, because that's something we can keep in the front of our minds and use mm -hmm. that as a yardstick when something doesn't feel right. right. Urgency, secrecy. The other thing is, if you receive a phone call, generally, be suspicious of any inbound phone calls. If that person who's calling is claiming to be a representative of whatever organization, then politely say, oh, thanks. Why don't I give you a call at your organization's phone number, right? G give me your name and I'm going to call your organization and I'll, and I'll ask to speak to you. And then hang up and whatever, or if they are from the local county jail or the local county courthouse, go online, go to the website, look up the phone number of the, the jail or the courthouse that's on the website, and then call that number and say, hi. I was just on the phone with Mr. So-and-so, and and we got disconnected. May I please speak with him? Right? If they claim to be from a particular company, they're, oh, I'm, I'm representing, I don't know, what, Target or whatever. Oh, okay, great. I'll give you a call. You Tell me your name, and I'm going to hang up, and then I will call you. And then you just call Target's customer service line and say, hey, I was just on the phone with, you know, so-and-so customer service rep from your company. This is the case number that we have, but you should be placing that as an outbound call because if you're placing it as an outbound call and you're calling the phone number that's listed on the website, then you're likely to be speaking. I mean, certainly scammers can build spoof websites as well, but you've added the friction there. You've created a, another filter within that funnel mm -hmm. so that you've got this added layer of protection. Mm -hmm. If you're getting an inbound call, you have no idea where the call is coming from. If you're placing an outbound call, you at least know who you're calling, assuming that the website isn't spoofed. Well, I let all unknown calls just go to voicemail. And the part of the reason for this is artificial intelligence. People right. are voice printing you. If you talk to them, they're getting your voice print and some financial institutions will use your voice to access your accounts. I mean, this is scary stuff. Well, I hate to tell you this, but if you host a podcast, they've got your voice. <laughs> True. Oh, well, another way to get it. <laughs> All right. Well, Becky, we wanted to go through sort of a list of scams so that people are aware of the breadth of this. We've touched on a few, mm -hmm. but in general, there's two types of scams. Uh, phishing, that's P-H. I-S-H-I-N-G, which are the online scams, the digital scams. And then there's the social engineering scams where you're basically in contact with a person, whether it be in person or by phone or these days video chat. Uh, you're, mm -hmm. you're dealing with a person. Uh, so, Becky, let's go through that list and help us get started. All right. All right. So we talked earlier about tech support. And when I first read this, I don't think I really understood what that meant. But is this someone calling you saying whatever it is? Or is this like when you try to call somebody asking for tech support? This is oftentimes you receive an inbound call in which they say, hey, I'm from Best Buy. So we'll go back to that example. I, I'd use Target as the example earlier, mm -hmm. but I'm from Best Buy. I'm from Microsoft. I'm from Apple. There is an issue with your device and you're going to need to send us money. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Or personal information, possibly. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Great. Great. Or let me onto your device and I'll help you fix it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And older folks aren't as tech savvy. I don't understand things the way my kids do. Mm -hmm. So that's easy to talk somebody into that. Yeah. Well, the other component to this is that there are these scams where there are these like done for you scams where layer upon layer upon layer builds, right? So another form of a tech support scam is, let's say that you, one day you decide that you want to start your own business, but you have no idea how to do it. So you go online and you enroll in what you believe, in what is marketed as an online course for how to start your own business. Very normal activity. There are a lot of, I'm a course creator myself. There are a lot of legitimate online courses out there. But let's say that this one that you enroll in is actually not a, a real course, just the beginning of a multi-layered scam. So you enroll in 
this quote unquote course, and they start sending you all of these quote unquote business opportunities, right? But then they tell you, you know what, you're going to have to upgrade your computer and you're going to have to upgrade all of your equipment in order to be able to run this business. But here, we'll send you a computer, right? And we'll send you something. And also, you're going to need to make a business filing and you're going to need to set up bookkeeping and you're going to need to set up accounting. And oh, doesn't that sound really complicated? LLC registration and bookkeeping and, and all of that. But guess what? Pay us a bunch of money and we'll take care of that as well. And, and then it becomes fee after fee after fee after fee of all of these downstream upsells, right? So that this, what you think was a $1,000 course that you quote unquote enroll, purchased or enrolled in turns into 30,000 by the end of it. And you still haven't really gotten adequate delivery of what they said they do. The computer that they said that they would send you still hasn't shown up. The LLC registration that you were supposed to have gotten was never actually filed. That's another, tech support is sort of an element of that, but that's another type of scam mm -hmm. that can happen. Mm -hmm. There is just one quick story and we'll get back to your list. A reality TV star named Jen Shaw, who was on the Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, who was actually convicted and sent to jail for running a scam just like the one that I just described. She was one of the ringleaders of a scam in which she used her celebrity and the trust that many people had in her as a celebrity to draw people into one of those scams in which she sold a fraudulent course and she sold these fraudulent products online. Yeah, I mean, celebrity gives you a lot of, that's one of the scams is the virtual celebrity scams where you could be Taylor Swift and say, you know, I got this for you and yeah. you'd get a lot of traffic, right? Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, there, there's so many names for these things. It's, it's almost funny. You talk about phishing, but then there's other kinds of phishing. There's spear phishing where they have your personal info already and make it sound more legitimate. So they're really spearing you. There's whale fishing where they're coming from the top down as the CEO to the employees saying, you've got to do this or that. Then there's something called smishing <laughs> where you're getting a cell phone and text messages, right? Where the bank says, oh no, you've got fraudulent activity. You've got to do this now and enter all your personal information. All this ishing. <laughs> Okay. And then there's the, the next thing on the list I've never heard of is spooshing. <laughs> Tell me what spooshing is. I, I actually don't know what spooshing <laughs> is. I haven't heard of that one. Oh, well, you mentioned it before, I think, because it's a fake website. It, it could be a charitable organization. It's a false charity. Mm -hmm. They may even be a, a full-fledged false charity. It's not just a one-time and done deal. And that's spooshing where you end up on a website from Google that isn't real. And this scared the heck out of me because you can go to these shopping websites and you think you bought something, but no, you just spent 300 bucks and it's never going to show up. How do you know that something's real? <laughs> I did that right. at Christmas. Now it was only a $25 item, but I bought something off of a Facebook ad and because it was mm. like the perfect gift for somebody. And after a week or so, I was like, is that actually going to show up? <laughs> they got my money. Mm. I don't know if I'm going to. And I, I did receive the article and I was very happy about that. But after that, I was like, you know what? I don't think I'm going to buy stuff off of Facebook ads anymore because I didn't think about it at first. And, but then later when it took a while for the item to show up, I thought mm, maybe this was not such a mm. good idea. <laughs> I mean, social media is a big source of scams these days. Mm -hmm. right. And all across the age spectrum, you, you've got to be very, very careful with social media as far as your romance scams, your shopping scams, your buying scams. Mm -hmm. It's e exploded mm -hmm. in the last few years, according to the article you sent us. We mm -hmm. talked a little bit about the, the celebrity scams. And then another thing on the list is government impersonation. And I think all of us have heard mm -hmm. of that, of somebody calling saying they're from the IRS uh, or, mm -hmm. you know, some government agency, but especially the IRS, that sort of strikes fear right. in everyone. So is that a, a situation where you would say, I'm going to hang up and I'm going to call you back? Or does the IRS just not ever call people? 
I, I have never heard, I don't want to make a definitive statement that the IRS never calls people. I have never heard of the IRS calling a person. Mm -hmm. Typically the IRS, if they need to contact you, will send a letter, Mm -hmm. right? They will send a letter in the mail. I have never in my life heard of any legitimate case. I I, I don't want to say that it never happens. I would need to talk to an IRS spokesperson to be able to to validate or verify that. Mm -hmm. But I have absolutely never heard of that happening. I've only ever heard of the IRS sending letters in the mail. And and I've heard Mm -hmm. the same thing. We talked about the charity scams. And then next on the list is romance. So how does this get started? I mean, I've obviously heard of this because that's what my friend's father succumbed to. But how does this happen? So typically, I mean, most people these days of all ages, including people in their 20s and 30s and 40s, you know, most people meet online. Most people meet their romantic partners online. So you might meet somebody online through a dating app or through a dating website. And that person, you and that person develop some type of a a relationship through text messaging, through phone calls, through emails, through digital communication. But perhaps you don't meet. Maybe it's long distance, Mm -hmm. right? During the pandemic, there were whole full-fledged relationships where someone was like, geez, I have a boyfriend of all ages, including people in their 20s and 30s. Oh, I've had this boyfriend for eight months, but we've never met in person yet. Mm -hmm. Or I've had this girlfriend for eight months, we've never met in person yet. So it's increasingly common that you might start to develop a romance with someone who you meet online, but who you haven't met in person. And where it becomes uh, a scam is then that person starts to say, hey, I'd love to come see you, but I need you to send me some money. Or, hey, I have this family issue that I'm dealing with and I need some money. All right. And you think, well, this is this is my love, right? This is my new boyfriend or girlfriend. Mm-hmm. Like, of course, I want to help them out. Yeah, I can send them something. I'm in a comfortable position. They're struggling. I'm happy to help. Mm-hmm. This is a person I love. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, that also leads into a very common one, grandparent scams. Can you give us an idea what a grandparent scam is? Oh, a grandparent scam is where basically they prey on the love that a grandparent has for their grandchild. And they will call and say that something bad will happen to the grandchild unless the grandparent pays some amount of money. It could be, and again, there's a whole variety of, I mentioned the UIs earlier. Hey, your grandchild is in jail. Your grandchild was arrested for a DUI. They're in jail. You need to send us bail, right? That's a common one. And you can't talk about it with anybody. There's also Mm. the version of it of your grandchild is in the hospital. Your grandchild was in an accident. They're in the hospital right now. And we need money immediately for your grandchild's treatment, Right. And that also creates that sense of urgency as well. There is the your grandchild is going to. So typically it's either your grandchild is going to be in legal trouble or your grandchild is in medical trouble. Right. And what grandparent wouldn't pay everything to keep their kid healthy and out of jail, Mm -hmm. you know. Right. Right. But they call and invent this story and create this false sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. To combat that. I mean, you put the phone down and you call your grandchild or you call your child who's the parent of the grandchild, right? That would be a very good idea. I mean, this this should be easy to avert if as long with just a few minutes of checking on is this real or not. But I understand right. that they're pulling at your heartstrings, but we all have to be careful and and check on is this real. Okay. Right. And one of these scams I found interesting that is Remember the movie Catch Me If You Can, the check forging scam back in the day, I think it was the 50s or the 60s, and this guy now fights scams. I can't remember his name. We'll have to put it in the show notes. But the check cooking and washing scams have become very popular again because checks aren't that popular. And what they do, or I learned what they do, is they'll go to a post office box so they get that key for it. They'll take out all the mail. They'll open it up, get all the checks. And then you use like nail polish to take the payee and the amount off. And then they'll submit the check for whatever amount they want to put on there. And then the latest version of it is more of an AI version where they just take a photo of it and reproduce it with any amount they want on it Mm. and take it out of your account. 
it's unbelievable. These things still happen. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's one that I've been hearing about recently that I'd like for you to just tell us a bit about, and that's SIM swapping. Can you, SIM swapping. SIM swapping. Can you tell us what that is? Now, I'm familiar with SIM swapping in the overseas context. Uh -huh. Because overseas, oftentimes when you travel, you need to switch out your SIM card, mm -hmm. right, in, in order to be able to maintain connectivity. Mm -hmm. So when you switch out your SIM card, what that means is that when you contact your regular contacts back at home, they're not going to see you as the caller, right? They're going to see some foreign phone number. Now, this happened to me when I went to Greece. I took my SIM card out of my phone. I put in a Greek SIM card. Mm -hmm. And then every single friend that I contacted, they didn't see me as the, the way that I normally appear as a saved contact. That's not what appeared in their phone. They saw a Greek phone number that appeared in their phone and it was me just contacting them. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes if there is a person who is traveling, then their friends and family are at risk of misidentifying a scammer as that person because that person can no longer be identified by their usual contact card. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I understand this correctly, and I may not, mm -hmm. I believe that one of the latest things is that someone calls you and they talk you into letting them load an eSIM on your card. And then that means they have access to everything you have connected to, which can be your financial institutions and passwords. Oh, because they now yes, have that... access to your phone. Right, right. That is a new one, actually. Well, I guess with that, with the popularity of eSIMs, because eSIMs didn't become popular. And I mean, I first heard about an eSIM less than a year ago, mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I'm relatively tech savvy. But yeah, with the popularity of eSIMs, this is mm -hmm. certainly a new one. You heard about Andy Cohen, the television host, co-hosts the New Year's Eve ball drop with Anderson Cooper. He just right after New Year's, he was scammed out of tens of thousands of dollars. And part one of the ways in which that happened is the scammer sent some type of a request to his bank and the bank tried to call him. The, the bank found it suspicious, so they called him to authorize it, but he had call forwarding set up. And so the call forwarding went to the scammers. Wow. Wow. So yeah, being able to intercept somebody else's call forwarding mm -hmm. also leaves you vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So Paula... <sighs> Can you give us an idea, and we actually may have covered this, so but just in case there's something left to talk about, is how is it that these are so believable? I think there's a confluence of factors. Number one, again, urgency, mm -hmm. right? All of us, all of us, when we are pressed with a sense of urgency, mm -hmm. there's a fire, mm -hmm. there's a, metaphorically speaking, there's a fire, there's a grizzly bear, right? So we are activated we are afraid and we are willing to do whatever it takes to fix the problem, right? And so that sense of urgency is often associated with a lot of these scams. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, particularly older people, we talked about secrecy, but there's sort of another element. There's also just loneliness and isolation. Mm. And typically if a person is lonely or is isolated, then think like a romance scam, for example, becomes more believable because it's so appealing, AARP has a great, great breakdown of some of the scams that the scams perpetrated against people who are, are 60 plus or, or 55 plus. And some of the anecdotes that they describe, you read the victims, the victims aren't simply dealing with the fallout of a scam. They're also mourning a breakup, Right. Because they're experiencing the grief and the loss that comes from a breakup because they really believed that they were in a romance with this person, you know? So, and that often comes, loneliness and isolation can fuel a lot of that longing. Mm -hmm. There is also, and I'm sorry, we have to say this, there is some element of cognitive decline that does happen to many people in later ages of life. 
And that cognitive decline can also impact decision making and it can impact your ability to to be able to spot those red flags. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, you mentioned the AARP. And I want to take a mm-hmm. moment to, they're a great resource for this. And mm-hmm. they have something that Frank Vesquez made me aware of called the Perfect Scam Podcast, where they go through these things and tell real stories with real people of the, the kinds of stuff they go through. And they also have a fraud watch network. You can go on to this and learn about all the different kinds of scams. They even have a heat map of where the scams are happening right now and what they are. Uh, They do a great job of trying to help us avoid these things. Mm -hmm. And so in saying avoid these things, what are some tips, I guess, then, that how do we avoid them? What would you recommend to people that are potential victims of these scams? What are these red flags and how do we avoid them? So as we've talked about, anytime that you feel a sense of urgency, know that that's a red flag. And again, that sense of urgency will likely come from the idea that somebody is in legal trouble or somebody is in medical trouble. That's often what fuels that. But anytime that you feel this sense of urgency, and that sense of urgency must be met with immediate money, take a pause. Because no no hospital emergency room is going to demand payment in order to perform a life-saving operation. That just doesn't well, happen. I don't know right? about that. I've worked in the ER. <laughs> but no, no. I mean, in all seriousness, you've worked in the ER. They do not demand payment. Uh, doctors are required to treat a person regardless of their ability to pay, right? I'm just teasing. And no, but, but, but it is exactly that idea the the what if the ER really does need payment, that's what gets people, that's what fuels that sense of urgency. It's precisely that worry that leads people to think, oh no, the ER needs this payment right now. I'm going to go send it because I don't want to take the risk. If Even if there is a 99% chance that this is a scam and a 1% chance that this might be real, I don't want to take the risk, that 1% risk that my grandkid is in the ER and the doctors are not going to save my grandkid's life, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think it's it's really important to, to be absolutely fundamentally clear that like that will never happen. It is not a 99%, 1% thing. It is a 100%, 0%. It is an absolute, no ER will ever do that, right? You're, you are correct. I was just teasing. Yeah. And then you mentioned the limbic system, and that is so mm-hmm. true. Think about a big market drop or crash. It's the same thing that act, gets activated. It's almost like a scam. You've got to weather the storm. You've got mm-hmm. to trust but verify that things are going to be okay. You just got to avoid taking quick action. Call somebody. Other things that you can do, I guess, for credit card scams is don't use a debit card. Use your credit card because it mm-hmm. protects you federally and the companies want to protect you. you know, only click on links that you trust. All, all those emails and phishing and online links that we get all the time. We are bombarded with potential scams. Just look in your junk email inbox. They're all there. There may be a letter changed or a .com versus a .org, but these emails, as if they're from companies or from people, can look very real. And I've succumbed to a post office scam where they said, oh, where they get some personal or a credit card number because if you pay a dollar, you can come to the post office and pick it up. They never do that. They leave something in your mailbox or on your door, but you get this text and it's like, oh my God, you do it. And then you're like, I just got scammed. Mm-hmm. Just like Becky mm-hmm. with her Facebook stuff. There are just so many ways and they come up with new and creative ways and we bump into them all the time. And We need to prepare ourselves for this. It's scary that humans want to trust. We're we're innately driven to trust, Mm -hmm. and it's hard to untrust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've got a couple of more questions. Number one is how do we recognize this? We've talked about how we can recognize it. What if... You are, and there may be lots of people in our audience who are in the position of caring for a parent or an older Mm -hmm. loved one. How can we recognize it in someone else? Is there a way we can Mm -hmm. 
look for signs to recognize that this is happening to someone else that we're responsible for? Mm. Well, first, we talked about romance scams. I, I would try to get as much, if, if you find out that somebody in your life has a new romance, try to get as much information as possible about that person. Hey, can I meet this person? If they're long distance, can I talk to this person over Zoom? Hey, this if this person is dating my mom or dad, right? I'd love to meet them. I'd love to. If they're local, I want to meet them in person. If they're long distance, I want to have a coffee with them over Zoom and I want to do it right now or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So I would, for romance scams, I would try to immediately get to know who that person on the other end of the line is so that you can sniff out, is this a real person or not? Get their, what's their Facebook profile? Are they on Instagram? Are they on Twitter? Let's see your LinkedIn from back when you were working. You must have had a LinkedIn at some point. Like, what is, the, what is this person's online presence? So that's one of the things I would do. I would also, especially with AI now and the way that voices can be imitated, I would have some type of, this is what I do with my own parents. We have kind of secret words, basically. Like I've told my parents, if you ever get a phone call from a voice that sounds like mine and that voice is asking for money, then we have a couple of basically safe words or mm -hmm. secret words. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I want you to ask me for these specific words, mm -hmm. right? And if I know those particular words, the passwords or the safe words or whatever you want to call, however you want to call them, all right, that's a way of knowing that it's actually me. Alternately, you can ask to FaceTime me because I'm like, mom and dad, real look, realistically, I am never going to call you asking for money. I've got plenty of money. That's just... There is no situation in which I would ever call asking for money. Mm -hmm. But if you ever get that call mm -hmm. and the voice is mine and you want to know whether or not it's me, number one, ask if you can FaceTime with me or Zoom or Skype or whatever your favorite video medium is, right? Mm -hmm. Number one, do that. Number two, ask for those passwords or those safe words. Mm -hmm. and, and number three, if you really want to add another layer onto that, just start quizzing me about various little tidbits from my childhood that only I would know. What was the name of my first goldfish? You know? <laughs> That's a good security question. Yep. yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Our family has yeah. done the same thing. We have a secret passcode because not only can AI duplicate your voice, but now they can create a video that looks like it's you in some compromising or dangerous situation. So we have the passphrase so that we know whether or not what we're seeing is real or not. Wow. It just keeps getting worse. Mm -hmm. I wrote when I was at Columbia, I wrote, I wrote a, a huge, almost thesis level paper on this topic. And at that time, AI was not really in the picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? amazing how much things have changed. Think of the political ads that have been duped. They can do right. the same thing with any of us. Yeah, I know. It's scary, but being prepared is our best defense. Well, you have to presume that all your information is out there on the dark web. Right. I mean, all these scammers are talking to each other. They're selling your information. A long list of this information is getting sold so they can blast out phone calls or emails with all the bots. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to protect yourself because the attacks are incessant. They're coming at you from all directions and all ways, shapes, or forms. And we're going to have a podcast dedicated with an FBI agent to how do you protect yourself on the internet? What do you need to do to protect your digital and personal identity? That's coming up. So there will be a oh, follow-up. that's fantastic. This. Yeah, this will be, there will be a follow-up episode to this that we're very excited mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Great. So if you find yourself or your loved one in the middle of a scam, how do you shut it down? First, make sure, first staunch the bleeding, right? Make sure that there's no additional future outflow of money. And that's going to depend on how the money has been delivered. Do they have access to your bank account? Do they have access to your credit cards? Or have you simply been sending them, have you been sending them wire transfers or cashier's check? Like the delivery mechanism of the money will determine whether or not they have the ability to get more money from you. Um, but make sure that you shut down any ability 
that they have to, to access your money. I would immediately report it to your bank, report it to the local authorities, right? Report it to, to because those are two institutions, your bank and your local authorities that should immediately know about this. You really file a complaint with the FBI. We, and I know you're reading from the FBI list right now, but the two best sources of information out there are AARP and the FBI. Both of them are at the forefront of this issue. The Internet Crime Complaint Center. That's why it's IC3 cubed. And I actually had to contact them when my identity was stolen. They're very helpful. And your bank will walk you through the steps you need to make. We had to change all the account numbers and transfer them into different accounts. There are authenticator apps that are very good now where in order to access your account, it brings up a different number every time that you have to put in as a security code. Mm -hmm. Because those text two-factor authentications can be, if they have your cell phone number or the SIM card issue, they can get those authentications and access your accounts. So they're, they're, the institutions are trying the best they can to avoid this, but the scammers are probably ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. And we haven't talked about password managers. So Paula, would you recommend that all of us ha have our passwords in a password manager? Absolutely. Absolutely. Keep all of your passwords in a password manager because that is the only way that you can have unique passwords on every single one of your accounts. So that if someone gets that, is they can't use that to break into any of your other accounts. Otherwise, it would be really easy. If someone got one of your passwords, they could just try that same access to one of your passwords. And we need to teach our kids about these things because it, it's hard to go backwards and change everything. It's a lot of work. And if you do it from the front end, and use, say, for example, the one I use is LastPass. Are there other password managers that you guys use? I've heard of those. We use OnePass. And, and I would suggest even with a password manager to set up two-factor authentication every place that you mm -hmm. can. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I agree. The Authenticator app is even more secure than, than text messaging. Mm -hmm. We've covered a lot of ground, Becky. We did. Paula has helped us out with all these scams. We've gotten to know her a bit, too, on the front end. And one of the things we'd like to, in order to round things out, because we put our best foot forward and we don't always tell folks about our mistakes. And late starters make a lot of mistakes. Everybody makes a lot of mistakes. Paula, can you give us what your biggest financial mistake was? My can biggest ever? Well, yeah. Whew, the biggest ever was not getting a prenup. So to anyone who's listening, if you do not have a prenup, if you're about to get married, get one. If you're already married, you can get what's referred to as a postnup. A postnup is similar to a prenup. It's simply a document that you draw up after the marriage, after your wedding day, right? After you're married. But either way, whether it's a prenup or a postnup, you need that agreement in place. I think it's especially important for women these days that acquire assets and have significant assets before they enter a marriage where women are the primary bedwinners. And I think it was in your case that you had these real estate assets or other things going on that became at risk because they were prior to the marriage, but they became accessible at the time of dissolution of the marriage, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So, Paula, what, what's been your biggest win or one of your biggest wins? Starting my own company, the as I said, the the highest income that I ever made as a W two employee was thirty one thousand dollars per year, and that was that's in two thousand and eight dollars. So adjusted for inflation, that'd be probably what thirty seven, thirty eight thousand, maybe maybe forty thousand dollars at the most today. So that's the highest salary that I ever made working for someone else. And if if I had stayed on that trajectory and just gotten 3% raises over time. I mean, I would be I would still be in the five figures today in terms of salary. So starting my own business, there is infinite upward potential there. And it sometimes it's slow to get going, but as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, you can grow your income to orders of magnitude beyond anything that you might have been able to achieve at your previous uh, W-2 job. 
Mm-hmm. And so I would say to anyone who's considering the route of entrepreneurship, it is for many of us, the single best opportunity that we have to really reach that next level. And we know all of the stats that the, the majority of millionaires are business owners. And in the FI community, we talk a lot about about the gap, the gap between right. what you earn and what you spend, and that we need to save the gap and then try to grow the gap. And while most of us could stand to do a little frugaling or a little whittling down of our spending, there's only so much of that you can do. But there is no ceiling. There's, there is infinite possibilities of what you can do on the upper end. Yeah, exactly. All right, Paul, your resources at Afford Anything are fantastic. But do you have any favorites outside of your own resources that you would point especially late starters to? Ooh, I have so many. (laughs) All right. To learn about the psychology of money, the way that the thought processes that we have around it, Morgan Housel. He's absolutely fantastic. He has two books. The first is called The Psychology of Money. The second is called Same as Ever. I would recommend them both. Let's see. There is a writer by the name of Nick Majuli. He writes a blog called Of Dollars and Data. He has a book called Just Keep Buying. Good for getting a grounding in in the investing side of, of personal finance. I'm a big fan of, of anyone who talks about behavioral economics. So much of personal finance is, I think, not prescriptive. It's not what to do. It's, it's why do we do what we do? And how do we better understand the way that the human mind works and the human condition so that we can then learn how to make more clear decisions and we can then learn how to work with our nature rather than against it? And so Dan Ariely and everyone who has worked with him, uh, they are some of the leading, that their research that comes out of the behavior lab, some of the reading, the leading behavioral economic research that's out there. So I would certainly look at them and follow their work. James Clear, just, he writes not about money, he writes about habits, but developing really strong habits is the cornerstone of good financial planning, right? It's first first automate, and then anything that you can't automate form habits. And so James Clear for habit formation is crucial to to personal finance. Uh, I would agree. I've read his book and Atomic Habits, and there's another mm-hmm. author that writes about habits, that these are important things. I, it took me to create good habits to turn my financial life around. That was mm-hmm. where the problems were. We're in the reflex habits of lifestyle inflation. And so I agree with you. And if you have any other resources for us that you'd like to share with our audience, please don't hesitate to send us links. We'll put them in the show notes. Yeah. Lastly, sure. lastly, mm-hmm. I want to know who you haven't interviewed that would be your next dream guest. Oprah. Absolutely. <laughs> Are, I you still trying? Are you still trying? Are you still trying? Yeah, I tried. So I interviewed her co-author. Oprah recently co-authored a book along with Arthur Brooks. They co-authored a book called something about happiness. The title is Build the Life You Want. And it's all about how, I mean, as the title says, it's all about how to deliberately construct a life that, that is true to you and that is likely to lead to your optimum happiness. Anyway, so Professor Arthur Brooks and Oprah co-authored this book together. And I was really trying to get them both on the show, but I got Arthur Brooks, whom I love. He's been on the show twice, on the Afford Anything podcast twice, and he's brilliant and an absolutely wonderful speaker and researcher. But but I was I was a little bummed that his co-author did not join us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you'll keep trying and I'm sure she will find out <laughs> that there's extreme value in being your guest on the show because I have to give you a little props. I love listening to your interview style. Oh, your thank preparation you. is fantastic and the way you conversationally get through all the topics that you want to get through and go in tangents that are truly interesting. Uh, Your interview, I I can only aspire to be the interviewer that you are. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. All right, Paula, we've come to the end of our time together. It's been awesome. We've provided a lot of value to our audience. I know they're excited about hearing from you. 
I want to thank you, as does Becky, I think, mm -hmm. for being on the show today. I hope we get to chat with you again in the future about other topics. Absolutely. I would love that. Thank you for having me on the show. All right. See you soon, Paula. See you soon. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Catching Up to Five. We would appreciate it if you could leave a five-star review so that our message can reach others. We are not lawyers, financial advisors, accountants, or tax experts. Please consult your own professional advisors before making any important decisions. Our content is for entertainment and education purposes only. We'll see you next time on Catching Up to Five.